you've got a Bible, turn with me to Judges chapter 5, which is where we're picking up this morning in our study of this book. It's pretty funny, I thought, in first service, we should have given, given away a, a free pass to next year's uh, Empowered to Connect conference to whoever owned child number 29. As we were singing, child number 29 just kept flashing on the screen, and I was going, oh boy, Whoever has that kid needs help. So I don't know. I don't know who that poor family was, but uh, it was just an, an interesting. I got distracted because everyone just kept looking. I don't know if it was child twenty nine through the whole morning, but anyway, um, we're just excited about that stuff, and I really hope you will take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, the upcoming one with Paul Chamberlain. We just, we want to be equipped because there are some. There's some difficult questions. There are hard things that we need to face as followers of Jesus, and we we really want to face those well. But uh, today we're in Judges, speaking of hard things. We've been in this book now for, I don't know what it feels like, a couple months maybe, but uh, we've only made it to chapter 5. And if you're visiting with us, this is a strange book. We're going to concede that in the sense that the stories are a bit unusual, the events are not familiar as much as some others are, the application sometimes is challenging for us to say, what does it, what does a story 3,500 years ago, full of warfare and bloodshed and all those kind of things, what does that have to do with me? And so part of our struggle has been trying to connect those dots. And I hope as you... As you approach scripture, that one of the things you'll consider doing is working hard, regardless of the story, but even certainly in this one here this morning, of working hard to put yourself into the headspace of the people that are going through it. And here's, here's why. I think sometimes we, we can read these stories and not, not, not feel what they're going through, and I don't mean that the whole goal is some subjective experience, but, but in doing that, I think the application flows. Let me just give you an example from this story here. Uh, these people, chapter 4 tells us, that, that we're reading about, that we're considering their story, for 20 years lived under the hand of incredible oppression. Uh, probably almost no one in this room has a parallel experience. Uh, these people raised a whole generation knowing that the prospects that their little children would ever taste, see, experience, or know freedom were humanly impossible. Some of them grew up as teenagers not having to think about what will we do with our lives, where will we live, what will life be like because there was no freedom with which to consider those questions. And for two decades, an entire nation was oppressed and brutalized in the most severe conditions imaginable. And I think it's important for us to start trying to feel, okay, what what is that like? Because here's what happens. As we start to put ourselves in that spot, I think the applications do start flowing out of that. Like I said, probably for us, the issue of living in a free country like Canada is not how do we gain skill to live under those conditions but here's what I think does happen to us I think as we consider those things some of you here this morning can identify in different ways some of you have lived with 5, 10, 15, 20 years up against things that are humanly insurmountable some of them are the consequence of our own sin some of them are battles with addictions Some of them are relationships that just don't seem repairable. I've talked to more than one person who counts their days at work like a prison sentence. Five, 10, 15, 20 years just saying, how long? And when does this end? And you see, when you start thinking through the story like that, all of a sudden the application becomes a lot more more significant, doesn't it? These accounts teach us how we can be faithful to God and walk through those times. And for that reason, we're doing 
hopefully justice to these stories. We're working through them slowly because there is so much to learn that I hope is is instructing and encouraging and applying to our lives. And so we come to chapter 5, kind of in the middle of a story. I'll set the stage for those who weren't here last week because basically we have a really interesting spot here now in Judges where chapter 4 and chapter 5 tell the same story from two different perspectives. Chapter 4 is essentially a narrative, meaning just sort of the details, the account of the story. Chapter 5 looks back at it reflects back at it in the form of a song. So after everything's done, we have a song sung, and that's what we're going to really be considering today. But chapter 4 tells a story that in its simplest form goes something like this. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They've been doing it for long enough that God stepped in, in judgment, brought along a a evil, brutal king who would oppress the people of Israel as a consequence for their sin. After 20 years of that, they finally cried out to the Lord. The Lord came graciously, mercifully, brought three different individuals to act as his instruments to deliver his people from that evil, wicked king to get his people back to a place again where they would have rest. In a nutshell, that's the story. That's kind of the the details of it, the plot line of it. Chapter 5, we'll now look back at that story. And it's actually a duet. So I had someone actually last week suggest that I sing this. Had I been on my toes, I would have said, you have a deal, but you have to come up and sing the duet with me. But I didn't think that quick, and I didn't make that deal, and I don't want to sing a duet. And for all those reasons, I will not sing this chapter to you. But that's, that's kind of what we come to. So if you look in verse 1 of chapter 5, it begins this way. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day. And what we're going to look at the rest of our morning is what they sang on that day. Now, before we jump into the actual particulars of the song, kind of beginning in verse 2 there, I want to just kind of consider two important questions. Firstly, why did they sing it? And secondly, why does the author of Judges include it? So what I mean by that is, this is Deborah and Barak's song that they sang on that day. It seems to be a spontaneous outburst of praise to the Lord in recounting this story. It's in nine stanzas, so we'll look at that in a minute. So why did, why did they sing it in the first place? And then, long after the events are done, someone, we don't know exactly who, writes Judges, and includes their words that takes a full chapter. Obviously, the Spirit of God is inspiring that. Absolutely, but, but there's a decision not just to have the author's words of Judges, but to include this song. So, firstly, why was it written? I think it's a very simple thing. This is a celebration. And people, when they celebrate, sing. It's kind of what we do. It's something in, in us. You go to a sporting event, and inevitably you get to the end, and what happens when your team is winning? I don't know about you, but you sing a taunt. Na 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 na, na 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 na, right? We won, you lost. It's a celebration. You burst into a song. God's people had been doing it before and after. You think back to Exodus when, when God delivered his people through the Red Sea. What did they do on the other side? Burst into song. What happens when the people of Israel are delivered from exile and come back to the promised land hundreds of years after this? They burst into a song. It's interesting, too, when we think forward to our future deliverance and we're given a scene of the throne room of God when all of God's people are finally there on that day. You know the day, I mean. The day when it's finished. What do we do? We sing. Because saved people sing. And this chapter, in one sense, is nothing more than that. It's a song that two people sing to celebrate the victory of God. Now, why does the author of Judges include it? I think for one simple reason. The song, the whole song, fits basically with the whole purpose of the whole book of Judges. And in sort of miniature form, this song rehearses the whole plot line of the whole book. That that sin brings chaos. It brings consequence. And we might sometimes sin and think, ha, huh, look, I, I beat that because lightning didn't strike. Have you ever heard that? It's like, I sinned. No lightning struck. As though somehow we have, we have cheated the, the consequence of sin, but we're told in Scripture, you reap what you sow. It might be slightly delayed, but the chaos comes. The consequence of sin is always there. This book takes an honest look at that. The reason we're told in the song, in the middle of the song, I think it's verse 8, 
The reason for all the chaos is they chose new gods. And as a result of that, all the brokenness that's going to be part of one of those stanzas happens to these people. Then we find out that God, in His great mercy, He comes along and saves them. It's part of the song. It's the heart, maybe, of the song. It's God's saving work. And then we learn the last part, which, again, Judges is so quick to want to show us over and over again. When God saves, He does it completely. He doesn't ever half save His people. He just totally saves them. There's rest. There's rest when he saves his people. And this song kind of contains that, which is sort of, like I said, sort of a miniature version of the whole book. So I think that's why the author of Judges puts it here in such a a prominent, big place for us to consider. Now, there's nine stanzas to the song, kind of like verses. I'm not sure what we'd want to call them. They're not even, the spacing is all weird, and scholars much more qualified than I have concluded that the song really functions in these nine pieces. And what we're going to do is just go through each of the nine sections, look at what they say, and then try at the end to kind of pull together a few a few applications. Uh, we might do some of that along the way too. It starts off in verse two like this. That the leaders took the lead in Israel... That the people offered themselves willingly, bless the Lord. Hear, O king, give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. That stands as one. Verse two and three. Which really kind of set the stage. And here's, here's what I want you to see as, as the first verse of the song is sung. It's all going to be about a praise or worship of God. Now verse 3 kind of puts it just plainly. There's no mistaking it. I will make melody to the Lord. This whole song is, is to the Lord. It's worship to the Lord. But verse 2 actually gives us a, a very interesting reason why they're going to sing and make melody to the Lord. It's, it's described this way. This was the day when leaders led and people followed. But the strange thing about the lyric of the song is that that fact is reason to bless the Lord. Now, how did, how did Deborah and Barak get from leaders leading and followers following to the Lord being blessed? Shouldn't the song be, let's, let's praise the leaders or praise the followers because this is their day, but they don't do that. They recognize the hand of God in this. Now, there's a couple interesting little things in the wording. The, the, the word that, or some translations say when the leaders led or when the people followed, it actually should be translated kind of like this. In light of the fact that the leaders led. Finally, after 20 years, the leaders did what leaders are supposed to do. They trusted the Lord and had courage. And in light of the fact that followers followed, God should be praised. Because Deborah and Barak both realize a critical truth. Had it not been for God intervening, had it not been for God working in these people's hearts, there was never going to come a day when leaders led and followers followed. God gets the credit. To bless the Lord, we sing that often in our songs. Have you ever stopped and kind of gone, what does it mean when we sing that we will bless the Lord? It's a strange sort of thing. It's a strange thing because the little phrase to bless something functions in two almost opposite ways. And it has to do with an inferior or superior. In scripture, it's usually speaking of people and God. So here's how it works. If, an, if a superior is speaking of blessing someone, what the word means is that they are giving them some sort of gift or skill or ability. So when God blesses us, you see how this works? It means he as a superior is giving us as the inferiors some sort of skill, gift, or ability. If you turn it around, when we sing we're going to bless the Lord, we're not saying we give God some sort of gift, skill, or ability. We're saying instead we're giving him credit or recognition that he is the giver of gifts, skills, and abilities. So it depends on kind of who the superior or inferior is, and it could be humans in a relationship. One human who is superior could bless an inferior, probably maybe like on the 15th and 30th of the month when you get a paycheck. In some ways, your employer has blessed you. They've given you something. But here in this little song, what it means is, Deborah and Barak are saying, God, from the outset, we're recognizing that you get all the credit. You have been the one to do something that was a gift, skill, or ability that leads to the whole rest of the outcome of this song. This is the hand of God. God 
spurred on leaders and followers and gave them courage and allowed them to do what the song is going to describe them as doing. And I hope that you will often pray for the leaders of this church, that God would give the courage, the strength, the ability to lead well. We need that. Some of you are them. Some of you are leaders. Some of you are sitting there going, okay, I'll pray, but you'll be the next leaders. Scripture holds leaders to a high standard. And I know often in prayer times it comes around to that. Like, Lord, we get it. We will one day have a high level of accounting to give. And as leaders, there are many pitfalls. But as I think on that too, there's equal pitfalls for followers. I don't think followers get off the hook. I think leaders get held to account and followers get held to account. And we need the Lord to work in all of our hearts that we would serve him well. But this is the day, that day, when it all happened. Stanza 2 goes from verse 4 to 5. And it's the introduction of Yahweh, the Lord. Here's how it goes. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped, yes, the clouds dropped water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. So they begin to sing, and the next thing they want to sing about is the Lord essentially showing up for battle. So in chapter 4, we're just simply told in like one little phrase, the Lord, the Lord went before them. And now in chapter 5, we get a bigger description of what that looks like. He's described as coming from Sinai. So the last place the nation of Israel really met the Lord in a massive way was at that mountain. The law came down, Moses met with God, the nation met with God. So they had this this recollection of that moment. And now the description is, it's like the Lord is coming from Mount Sinai, from the south, moving north. And as he comes, the heavens open up, and it rains, and it's all evidence of his arrival. It's also against a backdrop of all the Canaanite gods. Because the Canaanite gods lived in the north. I can't remember the name of the mountain, but that's where they believed they lived. And the Canaanite gods, particularly Baal, controlled the weather. So anytime there was any sort of change in the weather, it was evidence that Baal was at work. He, he had authority over the rain, over the you know, winds, over the storms. That's why they worshipped him, to try to get him to give rain in the proper season so their crops would grow. And what Deborah and Barak and Scripture is telling us is there is a God who's in control of the weather, But it's not Baal. It always has been and always will be the Lord. And now the evidence is this description of him coming from Sinai. It's not unlike the plagues in Egypt where all the plagues are against the backdrop of Egyptian mythology and the Lord shows his power and authority against that. Now the Lord in chapter 5 is being shown against the backdrop of all these made up fictitious Canaanite gods. It's showing that their authority and their power is empty. Stanza 3 from verse 6 to 8 gives us a picture of the situation before, before deliverance, before the battle. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. It's interesting that the two judges mentioned there are not leaders of Israel. Remember, we're waiting for the day when the leaders of Israel will step up, and the song says, oh, before that day, the only ones who are willing to step up, those aren't Israelites. God still was delivering his people. He still was at work, but he was using non-Israelite people to accomplish his purposes. The highways were abandoned, travelers kept to the byways, villagers ceased in Israel, they ceased to be until I rose, I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. When new gods were chosen, then war was at the gates, was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? Stanza 2 tells us of this time before that day when God saved Things were so bad that the caravans could no longer travel. That's, that's the language of this. The roads are abandoned. It's literally the caravans can't move about. The free passage of goods. So you picture these people in these little towns and villagers dependent on the fact that some sort of trader comes in and they can sell their crops, their goods, and buy the things they need to live. And all of that comes to an end. The best they've got is these sort of small little byways. They're trying to avoid the main routes. It's like saying, let's, let's conduct our business, but you can't drive on Highway 97, 33, or 1. Keep to the side roads. Maybe you can find a back logging road because it's so dangerous in any other sense. And so village life itself comes to an end. It's just a non-functioning society for 20 years. It just comes to a grinding halt until Deborah arose. Now when I read that, here's my mistake that I make. 
I read it like Deborah, the mother of Israel. Kind of like a term of like, wow, she's like the champion. That's not what it's saying. Did you catch that? It's not saying here's this woman who's like this mighty champion. I mean, she ends up as the instrument of God's deliverance. He uses her in powerful ways. It's actually a statement of surprise. Things are absolutely horrific. And then Deborah, this is her singing, I'm just a mom. (laughs) I'm just a mom. And God used me. I hope that encourages you. I don't know how many times in my life it's like, I'm not anyone. (laughs) God could deliver. Absolutely, he can deliver. But it takes someone much bigger, better, more qualified than me. Take some with a whole lot more skill than me. So I'll just kind of sit there and wait for the Lord to find someone who's able to do that. And all of a sudden we find right in the middle of all this brokenness, this loss, this hopelessness, God raises up a mom and says, I can deliver my people. Don't ever disqualify yourself from God's work. She tells us in verse 8 why things have gotten so dire. They've chosen new gods. They've abandoned the one true God. They've worshipped other gods. It's the same pattern. It's been going on in Judges right from the start. They trade off Yahweh for the false gods of the Canaanites and then all the consequences come down on them. They've got no shields, no swords. That's kind of the description. Here we are as a nation that doesn't have arms against a, an enemy that's got 900 iron chariots. That means it's impossible. We can't actually go to battle and win against these people. And yet, look at verse 9 again. Here's Deborah. She keeps coming back to this Staggeringly amazing observation. Yet the people offered themselves willingly. And on that day, God did such a work in their hearts that despite the fact that among 40,000 you couldn't count one shield, one spear, they came forward and gave themselves. The the actual wording there is they didn't hold themselves back at all. It's kind of like what we might say is there there was no plan, no backup plan, They were going into battle and the essential picture she's painting is we're going in completely. And there's no there's no plan for retreat. We trust the Lord enough that despite the fact we're not even armed, we'll go willingly. I know one of the things I love most about this church is the willingness with which it's like it's a don't let your heads get puffed up here too much there's a willingness to serve here I mean I've seen lots of churches probably you have too there is just a willingness that when something needs to be done people will say yep I'll do it I think what's described here is one of the things that's just an absolute joy of a manual like I said don't let your head get puffed up That's a good thing. And it's a thing that is a proper thing in response to God. Because it's ultimately Him we're serving, right? We, we, We get the benefits. Remember Peter, Jesus, after Jesus rises again, Peter's denied Him, and Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, yeah, you know, Lord. Okay, feed my sheep. Serve, serve my people. Your love for me will be demonstrated as you serve one another. Your love for the Lord is demonstrated as you serve each other. Stanza 4 takes us from verse 9 to 11, something like that. My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offer themselves willingly among the people, bless the Lord. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, you who walk by the way, to the sound of musicians at the watering places. There they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord. And verse 12, probably half of it's kind of this stanza, half of it's the next stanza, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. So now there's this proclamation. Let's just make sure that everyone hears about the triumph of the Lord. So now in the song, we're actually kind of on the other side almost of the battle, looking back and saying, let's make sure everyone knows. The description there in verse 10 is sort of a weird one. It's like, what do white donkeys have to do with anything? Like, We're just into economic categories now. Apparently 3,500 years ago, if you had a white donkey... You were wealthy because there just weren't a lot of them. If you rode a gray donkey, you were kind of like middle class. And then there's the poor people who had to walk by the way. It means you couldn't even afford a donkey. So basically verse 10 is saying, regardless of your station in life, 
you should be telling of the Lord's triumph. Notice, though, it's the Lord's triumph. It's always going to come back to him. It's not Barak's triumph. It's not even the 10,000 people with enough courage, the men who marched down, took on the chariots head on from chapter 4. It's going to be his triumph. And the only time people come into this in verse 12, it's the, the triumph of his villagers. Why did the villagers triumph? It's not because they were a superior military force. It's because they were his. And that's enough. If you're the Lord's people, that's all it takes to do what he puts before us. Stanza 5. I'm not going to read this whole one because it's longer. It goes from verse 12 to 18. Now it's an account or a record of the response of the various tribes to the call to battle. Chapter 4 actually doesn't give us this information, but evidently what happened is they were to go out and announce all the tribes that were going to war, and all the tribes should have come and responded in, in support, and instead it's a mixture of some who do, some who come with great courage, and others... Who don't? And through these verses, you get a summary of what the different tribes have done in response to, we're going to battle, you should come. All the way from Ephraim, verse 14, a very strange verse that English really struggles to figure out, how do we communicate this? Basically, what verse 14, if I was to try to describe it, says, some of Ephraim came, the reason Ephraim shows up is that that's the leading tribe. They should have led the way. Some of them came, but not all of them. But those who did come, and there's this odd little note. If your Bible has footnotes at the bottom, mine does, sometimes the little words in the bottom. There's a little word, Amalek. It's like, Ephraim came, but we're rooted in Amalek. That's literally what it says. Some of Ephraim comes, but they're rooted in Amalek. It's like, hold on a second. Amalek are their enemies. What does that mean? Basically means this. Some of Ephraim shows up, but they don't show up with the kind of character of the people of God. They show up bearing the character of their enemies, the Amalekites, these hostile, cheating, lying, broken, corrupt people. So the Ephraimites do show up, but they don't even seem like they're Israelites anymore. We go through the other tribes. Some of them, some of them show up like Ishakar and Zebulun. And notice the, the description there is not only do the tribes show up, but their leaders show up. On the day when leaders led. But the other tribes, no mention of their leaders. Oh, some men show up. Some come to fight, but not their leaders. But then Reuben, they're so busy searching their own hearts that they never actually get away from their sheepfolds. Well, they think about it going to battle and they sit there and they deliberate and they talk and they discuss it and then at the end of the day they've still been discussing it when the battle's long over Dan they're too busy with their ships which is ironic because they don't even live by the coast I mean you just go through all this description but by verse 18 we get the two tribes who respond best Zebulun and Naphtali they're the ones who risk their lives who led the charge into the teeth of Sisera's army Verse 19 to 21 is our next stanza. It's going to be the account of the battle itself. Actually, sorry, to verse 23. My apologies. The kings came, they fought, they fought the kings of Canaan at Tanik by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver. From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away, the ancient torrent. The torrent Kishon, march on, march on my soul with might. Then loud beats the horse's hooves with the galloping, galloping of his steed. Curse Meros, says the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. It's interesting, chapter 4 tells us a bit of a battle plan, where the soldiers are, how many there are, what they do. This is the battle. No mention of armies, no mention of numbers. It's just the Lord. You notice that when chapter 5 celebrates it, God showed up. And when God showed up, the, the stars themselves fought. The, the rivers fought. God just took all of creation and bent it to achieve his will. Most likely what's happening is there was a massive flood. The chariots got stuck in the mud and were crippled. What should have been the great military advantage actually became a liability. The only description we have there is in verse 22. The horses are running away in fear and panic and chaos. And it's like onomatopoeia type of language. The words in verse 22 are like the sound of a horse's hoofbeat to get that sense of the complete destruction of the armies of Sisera because God showed up to battle. 
Stanza 7, uh, 24 to 27, is the praise of Jael. That's the woman who drove the tent peg through Sisera's head. We had fun with that one last week. So if that just sounds really bizarre because you weren't here, go back, read chapter 4. You'll get the idea. She's not an Israelite, steps in, ends up bringing death to the general of this other wicked army. She's then honored, and a little bit of the song is sung for her, which leaves us just with two last stanzas, verse 28 to 30, which is a part of the song now sung about Sisera's mom. I think the idea is that there's a contrast between Jael, this one woman who lives in a tent who's named, and Sisera's mom, who lives in a palace and looking out through the lattice but never gets named. It's interesting, in Scripture, God... God only seems to name the things that have a place in his creation. When you read scripture, notice that. So in in Genesis, when you read Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, there's a big emphasis on things being named because they belong. And we go to scripture and we say, why doesn't God ever just explain to us the problem of evil? Go read it in Job. The answer seems to be, God just will not give it a place because it doesn't belong. He's not ignorant of it. He will deliver from it. But he doesn't talk about it because evil doesn't have a place. It wasn't supposed to be here. And here this woman is an unnamed mother of Sisera. And here's the question she's wrestling with in verse 28. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Now we know the reason. He's dead. There's a little bit of us where we kind of go, wow, this is, this is actually tough. Here's a mom now waiting for her son to come home. But just as you start to feel a little bit of sympathy for this woman, look at, look at what they agree together. Her and her counselors, the princesses beside her. Verse 30, here's what they must be up to. Have they not found and divided the spoil, a womb or two for every man? And then he goes on speaking of the clothes and the garments they've taken. She says, oh, I know what he's up to. He's up to what he's always been up to. Because after the battle, they kidnap and rape all the women. Oh, that explains it. He'll be home soon. The point is that we're supposed to realize that these are sinful, wicked people. They don't even use a term that would say a woman or a girl. It's highly sexualized. An object of, you know, some sort of sexual object. That's, oh, that's where he is. But he's not. Instead, a woman that God has used to intervene has ended his life. The last verse is our last stanza, verse 31. So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might and the land had rest for 40 years. There's only two types of people in the world, right? Enemies of God and friends of God. Make sure you're a friend of God. Make sure you come to know him through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, how do we apply this? Let me just quickly suggest a couple things. Number one is this. Chapter five, I think, is there so that we would be forced to realize that there are two perspectives in every story. There's the perspective we see with our eyes in chapter four. Who goes to battle and where they stand, of where the horses run, the place names, the leaders' names. And then there's a chapter five perspective, which is the God side of the equation. See, chapter four tells us that God shows up, but that's it. Chapter five brings it to life. It's like, oh, he comes, and the clouds open up, because he's arriving from Sinai. He comes from the south, and the whole story, the whole scene is depicted through the lens of a very present but unseen God. He's the hero. It's his triumph. He's winning the war. He's winning the battle over and over. He's going to get all the credit, because everything that happens in this is his story. And life's like that. You can see life through very human eyes. Paul describes it this way in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, you can fix your eyes on what's unseen, and that's the real, or you can just keep fixing your eyes on the seen. But he said, here's the problem. That's not real. It doesn't last. Paul goes on in that same passage, and he says, the the reason why he is so concerned with us fixing our eyes on what is unseen is because that is the only hope we have to not lose heart. He makes two specific observations. He says, if we fix our eyes on on what is seen, here's what we're going to see. We're going to see our bodies break down, and we're going to see troubles all around. That's all we'll see. And we will lose heart. It happened to me this week as I was looking at the Best Buy ads, looking at the TVs. It's like we've got, I don't know what ours is, 40-inch or 42-inch. There's a 55-inch, and I said, we should get a new TV. To which I was told, we don't need a new TV. It's like, 
But the hockey puck keeps getting smaller and smaller, to which I was told, you should really wear your glasses. I'm like, ah. All right, I guess we don't need a new TV. I just need to wear my glasses, right? But that's, that's what Paul's getting at. It, I vowed to never be this guy that would stand up in front and start talking like this. Because when I was 20, I remember just standing there going, oh, wow. That's really sad. This poor old guy is talking about his body breaking down. It happens. And life is full of troubles. And you don't need to go looking at the Syrias and the Russias, although there's full of troubles. Life is full of trouble in our, our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own homes. And Paul says, if all we look at is the real stuff before us, this kind of stuff... And we don't fix our eyes on the unseen reality that lies just behind that we'll lose heart. By chapter 5, he carries on with this. This isn't just like a one-moment thing for Paul. He says, oh, but we're the people of good courage. Why? Chapter 5, verse 6, that's what he says. Chapter 5, verse 7, because we walk by faith, not by sight. We know there's more to this life than just what you see and touch. And chapter 5 is our clue in this story that there is so much more. If you're losing heart, if you have no courage, fix your eyes on an unseen reality. It is real. Second thing, last thing, really quickly, that I want to mention is this. Some of you are here today, and that day hasn't arrived yet. Make sense? You're still up against it. Whatever is crushing you, it's still there. Don't stop crying out to the Lord. He invites it. The Psalms are full of it. Judges is evidence that he does hear, that he does answer. You might have cried out for 10 years. Continue to come before him in the confidence that that day will arrive. Jesus speaks so often in that language. Many will say to me on that day, I will not drink again of the cup until that day. Paul speaks of that day. They look forward with incredible hope and expectation to a moment of deliverance. That day that they're speaking of, the ultimate deliverance, but I think for those who are followers of Jesus, oh, there's moments of incredible deliverance all along the way. Don't lose heart. In fact, today we want to pray with you if you're wrestling and saying, all I can do is cry out to the Lord. I need that day. I need a that day moment. After the service, we'll have some people at the front who will be happy to pray with you, to bring your cry before the Lord. But don't lose heart. That day could be tomorrow.